Hello and welcome. My name is Cindy Heitzman, Executive Director of the California Preservation Foundation. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on materials conservation masonry. The format for today's webinar will include an hour presentation followed by time for questions and answers. There's a toolbar on the right side of your screen, and so if you have any questions at any time during this presentation, please type it in the box and I will either reply to you or we'll hold the question until the end for the panelists to answer. Please refer to the audio tab in this toolbar and select it if you're listening through the telephone or speakers. To hide or unhide this toolbar, click on the orange arrow and please adjust your volume on your computer or your telephone. Today's presentation will be by Carolyn Searles, Senior Principal with Simpson Gumperson Heger. Carolyn Searles has 30 years of experience in investigation, design, and construction administration of building envelope repairs on both historic and contemporary structures throughout the United States. She's been recognized with California Preservation Foundation Design Awards for her work on the Presidio Landmark, the Griffith Observatory, Natural History Museum in Los Angeles, and the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco. Carolyn is a fellow of the Association for Preservation Technology International and a past board member of CPF. She is head of Simpson Gumperson Heger's Building Technology Division in San Francisco. We welcome Carolyn today and we thank you for joining us. Thank you, Cindy. Um, thank you everyone for attending this webinar and please feel free to go ahead and send questions as I'm going along and I will answer those. Um, today's topic is materials conservation masonry and I'm going to focus on masonry building facades. As soon as I determine how to advance the slides. <laughs> there we go. Um, learning objectives for this uh, webinar are for you to understand the different types of masonry units and the common configuration of masonry walls, to recognize signs of deterioration that you might see in masonry building facades, and then we'll go over some common repair techniques such as cleaning, pointing, patching, partial replacement, replacement, and retooling stone. Um, and I'd like to finish with some tips on the construction document bidding and construction administration. So this is my outline. There are basically six different topics I'll cover. Um, we'll start with types of masonry materials and walls, then the process of investigation, common problems you'll see, repair considerations, the construction process, and then finish with a few key ideas. And you can follow along with where we are in the webinar by looking at the um, title at the bottom of the slide, and that will show you which topic we're on and how far we're go we've gone. So let's start with masonry materials. I like to break those down into three different categories. One is the traditional materials, and that's brick and glazed brick, and then different types of stone, of course sediment sedimentary, metamorphic, and igneous stone, and adobe. Then there's what I call the great pretenders, which are architectural terracotta and cast stone, or precast concrete. And these days we often think of terracotta and cast stone as original, historic, traditional materials, which they are, but it's interesting to remember that when they were first produced, they were cheap imitations of carved natural stone. And then the third category is mortar, which holds everything together. A couple of especially challenging materials um, that I want to highlight. One is sandstone. And I think the best description of sandstone I've heard came from a petrographer who I was working with, um, and that's a geologist who specializes in looking at materials such as stone and concrete under the microscope to tell us about the constituents and deterioration patterns. Anyway, this photographer described the sandstone as it wants to be a beach. And that's basically what sandstone is. It's grains of sand held together with a binder. And it does seem to have a lot of problems. It tends to reject patches. Um, it also tends to exfoliate, as you can see in these photos. Um, 
sometimes if it's face bedded, so if you put the stone in the building the opposite way from where it was in the ground, the layers will tend to come off. But then some of the stones that we commonly see in um, the San Francisco Bay Area, even if they're not face bedded, will tend to delaminate like this. Another especially challenging material and very interesting material to work with is terracotta. And some of the reasons that it's challenging is it's a barrier wall system. There's no backup waterproofing. So if water gets through the glaze, then it's usually in the building. The glaze is often very impervious, and it, that's how it was originally sold. Um, the marketing for terracotta in the 20s when it was originally sold was that it never needs maintenance. It's an impervious material. You know, they're selling it as the perfect material. Um, but it relies on that glaze being intact. As soon as there's a crack or a pinhole or a craze, water can get into the bisque, and the bisque underneath the glaze just absorbs water like a sponge. And then you have things happening like this little garden of mold and algae growing underneath the glaze. Um, another challenging thing about terracotta is it has very high moisture expansion. So we'll talk a bit about moisture expansion of brick and terracotta, but terracotta really has high moisture expansion, and that has to be accommodated in the design of the cladding. Terracotta also, I think, has a more complex anchoring system than stone or brick. So in the drawing on the right, you can see I've put a little red arrow pointing to every um, metal attachment. Um, angle or hanger or rod that's used to attach this little terracotta cornice. And unfortunately, when terracotta buildings were built, all of those were ferrous metal, not um, stainless steel. So they're all available to corrode. Um, so it's, it's anchored with a lot of secondary steel. Before we talk about conserving the materials, I think it's useful to understand different types of wall systems in which you might find masonry. And there are three different, basically three different types. There's load-bearing masonry, um, which was used for a very long time, thousands of years. And then transitional masonry buildings came in in the early 20th century. And now we have modern curtain walls and cavity walls. So we're going to look at each of those three types of systems and think about how are the loads carried and how is water managed. So the first one is load-bearing masonry, traditional masonry buildings. The floor loads are carried by the masonry. So the floor framing just sits on the masonry walls, and you end up with very thick walls at the base of a tall building. The walls also function as a reservoir. So when rainwater hits the masonry, it usually gets absorbed into it. The sun comes out, and it evaporates. And that's the whole water management system. Now I'll jump to contemporary curtain walls, which are very different. Um, sometimes those are masonry, too. And the, the floor loads are carried by the building frame, by the structural frame. So the walls don't get thicker as you go down to the bottom of the building. The skin or curtain wall carries its own gravity loads and transfers wind loads to the frame. And it employs, a, usually, a drainage plane and backup waterproofing. So if water gets beyond, say, a sealant joint, it can weep down and weep back out of the building. Another important point about contemporary curtain walls is they're free to move independently of the building structure. Now let's talk about those buildings that are in the middle. In between the load-bearing masonry and the curtain walls, we have what we call tr transitional masonry buildings. And they have some features of both types of buildings. They were a transition between the two types. The walls are still fairly thick. Usually, say, three widths of brick is a common thickness of the wall. Um, the floor loads are carried by the structural frames. There's usually a shelf angle at each floor level that gets the loads back to the structural frame. So that's sort of like a curtain wall. but like a bearing wall building, the walls still function as a reservoir. There's usually no secondary waterproofing system. It rains on the walls, the moisture goes in, and then the sun comes out and it dries out. 
Another thing about trans transitional masonry buildings that affects a lot of the problems we see with them is the walls were not detailed for differential movement between the skin and the structural frame. So you'll have a steel frame or concrete frame building and the bricks or terracotta or whatever the cladding is are just built tight around the structural frame. And most of the tall masonry buildings that we see in our downtowns are transitional masonry buildings. Now I'd like to go through some of the different components of the transitional masonry buildings. So we'll talk about each one of these. First is the embedded steel frame. Um, most of these buildings have steel frames. Even small buildings, like this little two-story firehouse, you wouldn't expect to have an embedded steel frame, but it does. Um, one clue to that is that you may see cracks at the corners of the buildings, vertical cracks, and a lot of times those align with the steel frame and can indicate corrosion. <laughs> Another problem to be on the lookout for with masonry buildings with embedded steel frames is it's difficult to anchor the masonry properly around the steel columns and steel beams. So in this uh, photograph, you can see that the steel column is pretty close to the face of the building, and there's only room for one wife of brick to go around the steel column. And there's not really anything to anchor that brick back. Um, usually with transitional masonry buildings as well as um, load-bearing buildings, the brick is anchored back with header courses. And I've marked the header courses here with little diamonds. And so that's where you turn a brick sideways, and it's built into the backup wife. So that ties the different layers or wife of brick together so they can act as one thick wall. Now this building was interesting because we saw all these headers and we thought, oh, this is great. The walls are really tied together well. But when we made our openings, we saw a lot of them were false headers. They were just bricks that had been turned and cut in half, and they were not real headers. So that's something else to, to be on the lookout for. Another feature of um, transitional masonry buildings is spandrels and shelf angles. Because these tall buildings have to support the masonry cladding somehow, it doesn't, all the loads don't go down to the base of the building. <coughs> so the veneer is carried by a spandrel or shelf angle at every floor level, and it's attached back to the structure. Um, to make it work, these spandrels and shelf angles, as well as lintels over windows, are usually pretty close to the outer face of the building. And again, that makes them vulnerable to corrosion, because there's not much mortar in between that shelf angle and the outer face of the building, which is going to get wet. So on the left, you can see a lintel that's corroded, and on the right, a corroding lintel, and then some mortar that is kind of pushed out that I've circled in red, and it looks like um, maybe it's been repointed in the past, and I think that's a good clue that there may be a shelf angle or something under there that's corroding. <laughs> um, the solution, so you don't have this problem of corroding shelf angles, is to have waterproofing or flashing. And that was sort of developed in the 1930s with the, you can see in this uh, typical drawing with a little bit of flashing um, on the left where I've pointed with the red arrow. In the middle one, you can see they've improved it a bit more and the flashing goes all the way up the face of the spandrel beam. But then on the right, here's a building constructed in 1948 with a cavity wall and there's absolutely no waterproofing or flashing over that shelf angle. So. Sometimes you'll find it, and sometimes you won't. Mortar joints um, between the masonry units are very important in how the wall and how the masonry itself functions. And they have several purposes. One is that they're the structural adhesive that glues the masonry together. Um, they provide water resistance. And they need to be compatible with the adjacent masonry. Um, Typically, these uh, historic masonry buildings have no expansion or contraction joints or control joints. So you won't usually see any sealant joints at all. They'll just be all hard mortar joints. And another feature of these buildings, of course, is openings, so windows and doors. 
we could design uh, very structurally sound waterproof buildings if we didn't have to put windows and doors in them. But of course, we like windows and doors. And they're often a character-defining feature of the building, but they're also a potential avenue for water infiltration into the masonry walls. Projections are another feature of these buildings, and they work really well to direct water away from the facade elements below. So all the cornices and water tables that you see on buildings do a good job of taking the water that's running down the face of the building and directing it out away from the building. But they all have sky-facing surfaces, and all those joints have to be watertight or covered with some type of flashing. So I like to think of all these horizontal projections as small roofs that need to be watertight. Um, and on the bottom right, you can see what happens with a cornice if it's not kept watertight and water gets in and in this case has corroded the um, outriggers supporting this terracotta cornice. Gutters and downspouts are important features of masonry buildings. Um, they must be maintained. And we find they can be really uh, problematic when they're embedded in roofs and walls, such as on the right. So you can see the staining on the cement plaster where somewhere in that wall, water, uh, the downspout has gotten clogged. And now water is just spewing out the top of that scupper. Um, hidden gutters are also tough. A lot of our tile roofs, which are pretty common even on these high-rise buildings, have hidden gutters where every other tile is left out and then there's a copper gutter or a gutter underneath. And if those are not maintained, um, you can have a lot of water infiltration and deterioration of the cornice below. Um, so our next topic is the investigation process. And I think everyone who's listening to this is probably familiar with this process, but I've just laid it out here on the left. Um, one thing I really want to emphasize is the importance of close-up inspection. And you really need to get hands-on to understand what's going on with these buildings. Um, the photo on the right is a building in San Francisco that happens to be clad in concrete. And it didn't look too bad, except uh, it looked like the paint coating was failing. But when I actually got up there and started tapping on it, I could hear that it ha sounded hollow. And with a little bit of probing, I could see that the concrete was spalled where the rebar was corroded. And really, all that was holding these pieces of concrete on the building was the thick paint coating. Now, if I just looked at it from the street, I never would have known that. So it's really important to get close up, hands on the masonry to understand what's going on. Also, the more, I think, research and close up inspection and testing you do in design, the fewer surprises you're going to have during construction. A good reference for this um, architectural investigation process is Preservation Brief 35. The next thing I'd like to talk about is deterioration of masonry. And I've divided that into three uh, main categories, environmental, structural, and design and construction problems. So let's start with the most common problem we have, um, and that's water. One way the problem you see with water a lot is rising dam. And that's where water from the ground is seeping up through and into the masonry, in this case into this brick wall, and uh, causing quite a bit of efflorescence. Rainwater, of course, also can cause a problem just by leaking through open joints and deteriorating the masonry. Another problem we see sometimes is vapor drive. Now, water vapor will flow from regions of high vapor pressure to low vapor pressure. And so they, it can actually go through masonry that is fairly porous. Also, air infiltration carries a lot of moisture. Sometimes people worry a lot about vapor drive when really their problem is just open joints or leaky windows. And as that water comes in, especially in San Francisco, where it's very humid and has lots of fog, um, it carries moisture. This photograph is from a building in San Francisco um, in the Presidio, where it's brick masonry on the outside, and then it's coated with a fairly non-breathable paint on the inside. And we had a lot of water vapor 
vapor pressure um, from the outside coming through and causing all this fail efflorescence and failures of the paint. Um, you can do um, different types of analyses, computer analyses, to predict whether you will have a vapor drive issue um, and to find out uh, where uh, water will condense within a wall system, and that can help you when you're designing the repair of a historic building to determine, you know, should I put a coating on the outside, should I put a coating on the inside, how, how should I deal with that issue. Um, another problem that water causes is corrosion of the embedded reinforcement, um, whether it's a steel frame or reinforcing steel. Um, as you can see here on our same small firehouse, we had quite a bit of corrosion of that steel column and um, what we call rust jacking. So when steel corrodes, it, the, the rust takes up a lot more space, like eight to ten times the space of the steel. And that pressure from the corrosion product is enough to crack uh, brick, concrete, any kind of masonry. Another environmental problem we have is expansion contraction. And so this is the recently restored um, Richmond Civic Center. And it's a single wide brick veneer over reinforced concrete. It has no expansion joints. It has these large areas of brick, brick veneer. Um, when I was first out there doing the condition survey, I started noticing these cracks at the corners. And I became concerned about that, thinking, well, maybe there's a problem with the brick expansion. And so we took a closer look and found that that brick was displaced out an inch or so. And we made some openings and found that the brick ties were broken. And so in the photo on the right, you can see that uh, metal brick tie, and you can see how it's broken. And what happened is brick, um, as well as terracotta, which you mentioned before, brick expands over time. It's the smallest, a brick is the smallest it will ever be when it comes out of the kiln. And then over time, just from moisture in the air, it grows. Concrete, on the other hand, over time, shrinks due to creep and shrinkage. So in this building, which had no provisions for those kind of expansion contraction movements, the brick was growing. So you can see it's getting taller on the left side of the photo. The concrete is shrinking, so it's getting shorter, and it just tore itself apart. This also happens on terracotta buildings. And terracotta has even higher moisture expansion than brick. And so the terracotta will grow on this particular building. The concrete building frame would shrink. And then the terracotta is cracked, and it's actually bulging out where it's just getting crushed by that expansion. Another environmental cause of deterioration are salts or efflorescence. Um, and salts are found in some bricks. They're found in mortar, in soil, and in cleaning products. And the efflorescence can obviously damage the masonry. Sometimes it will form underneath the surface of the masonry, in which case it's called subfluorescence, and then it will cause spalling of the masonry. So a chemical analysis of the efflorescence can tell you what kind of salts you have, and then you can deduce from that sometimes where the salts are coming from. Another environmental cause of deterioration is acid rain. And a good example of that is um, Frank Lloyd Wright's Innis House in Los Angeles. Um, these are site-made concrete blocks that he called textile blocks. Unfortunately, they were very poor quality. And so the acid rain in Los Angeles and the chlorides from the ocean melted away some of the blocks. Um, this building also had a lot of other problems, such as poor waterproofing details, um, a flawed design where there was a lot of exposed uh, mild steel reinforcing, and some previous repairs that um, made things worse. But acid rain was one cause of the problems there. Another environmental problem we have is biological organisms. So whenever you see things growing out of your masonry wall, that's a clue that you have a problem, um, such as the, the mold or the um, moss growing out of this brick. 
On the left, you can see a terracotta block. On the top is what it looked like when I first got there to take a look at it. Just a little bit of crazing of that. But if you take a chisel and you just start touching that glaze, it all flakes off, and there you have your whole garden underneath of um, slime mold and algae growing underneath the glaze of the terracotta. And it will eventually cause that glaze to fall. Another cause of deterioration of masonry walls is structural damage. And that occurs when the building is subjected to loads that it can't take. So it just says, no, I can't take that stress. I'm going to crack. I'm going to fall off, whatever. So it's unanticipated loads. And this is a church in um, Santa Monica um, after the Northridge earthquake. And that's kind of what you would expect when we talk about structural damage of masonry facades. Now this is a bit more subtle. This is a tower in San Francisco. And on the right, you can see that it's kind of bulging a little bit. And then once we got up close off of the swing stage, we could see some pretty big cracks in the corner. And so right away, and probably based on what we've talked about so far, you'd say, oh, that's corrosion of the steel frame. Well, that's what I thought, too. But we decided to make some openings to make sure, and I'm really glad we did. First opening, we saw corrosion of the steel frame. Ah, well, that tells me what I expected. Second opening, the steel frame looked really good. It was still painted. It looked fine. Well, it turns out, after some analysis, we found that these weren't cracks weren't really caused by corrosion. They occurred during Loma Prieta um, in the earthquake because inside this tower is a stair tower. So it moved a lot more than the rest of the building because there were no floor levels. There was no floor diaphragm to make the whole thing stiff and not move so much. So these um, vertical cracks were actually from the earthquake. Um, another cause of problems is deterioration of masonry walls is design and construction problems. Um, um, and I want to talk first about original material selection, and then we'll talk about repairs. So as far as the original material, um, as I said, sandstone is really a difficult uh, material. Um, one, there are many Calusa sandstone buildings in San Francisco. One example is the St. Francis Hotel. And with Calusa sandstone, um, water soaks into the stone. It goes in and it dissolves the calcite binder. It brings it out to the surface, turns it into gypsum, which is expansive. The stone also has expansive clays in it. And all those things form a hard surface crust that eventually spalls off the building. So um, that's really a problem with the original material. Another a famous example is Oliver Alto's Finlandia Hall in Helsinki. Um, it was clad in white Carrera marble. And um, Carrera marble is notorious for bowing. It's under moisture and thermal cycles. Um, it curves. So that's not an intentional design that you see in the photo on the right. Those are supposed to be flat marble panels, and they've all bowed. Um, another type of design and construction problems, I would say, is unfortunate previous repairs. So on the right, we have the Ennis House again. Um, it was coated. I think they started to see problems with this textile block and said, oh, well, we can coat the building, and that will fix it. So they coated it with an industrial tank coating, which was very impervious, and it trapped the water beneath the coating and just accelerated the deterioration of the blocks. Um, there were also some copings put on the walls, which is usually a very good idea. But it wasn't done exactly how I would do it, which is to have the coping come all the way out to the edge of the block. But I can completely see why that decision was made, because from the ground, you didn't want to see the edge of the coping. So that's one of the trade-offs that um, you're kind of, you kind of face when you're designing repairs for these type of historic masonry buildings. Um, on the left is a terracotta building. And in an attempt at making it um, more structurally sound or seismically safe, the terracotta was drilled with holes and foam injected behind the blocks. And the holes were filled with sealants, which then attracted dirt. 
and the mortar joints were all painted, and I'm not, I'm not sure why, but that was neither of the repairs really did any good, and uh, they, they uh, eventually caused problems. So now we're to the part of the webinar where I'd like to talk about repairs. And I'm sure all of you being working in preservation are very familiar with the Secretary of Interior's standards as the guideline for all buildings listed on the National Register. And you know many other cities also require um, repairs to meet those standards. Uh, there are four standards. And the one that we most commonly use, or that I most commonly find um, being used, is rehabilitation. So looking at the standards for rehabilitation and thinking what really applies to masonry conservation, um, these are the three things that, that I keep in mind. Um, the standards allow for the repair and replacement of deteriorated features while maintaining the historic appearance. Um, if possible, you want to repair rather than replace. And if you must replace, it wants you to use original materials. Um, the rehabilitation standards do allow for new uses that require minimal change to the materials, features, and spaces of the building. And they allow for compatible additions. So preservation principles that I try and apply to masonry facade repair are to diagnose the problem. Um, usually there's more than one solution. And we can present a range of repairs um, to the owner, to the person making the decisions about the repairs, with the pros and cons. Um, of course, we want to preserve the existing fabric and repair rather than replace if that's possible. And then if it's possible, replace in kind. <laughs> but a lot, quite often we do end up using substitute materials, and I think the important thing is to understand the ramifications of those and how to design them correctly, and then understand the visual implications of the repair. So now I'd like to talk about uh, typical repairs. Um, sometimes we're called out to look at a building because a brick or a piece of terracotta has just fallen off. And so the first thing we have to do is address safety hazards. And sometimes that will be to implement um, temporary stabilization measures, such as the straps on the right, which the arrow is not pointing to, or the um, kind of netting on the left side. Other times, it might involve putting up a sidewalk canopy around the building. If possible, it's good at this time to address water infiltration sources so that the deterioration does not get worse. And then we also want to implement monitoring so that the temporary repair does not become a permanent repair. Um, one general thing to think about when you're designing repairs to masonry buildings is the durability of the different components. Um, so if you're designing a flashing and it's self-adhered instead of metal, well, that how long is that self-adhered membrane going to last? Maybe 20 years? But how long will the brick last? Those bricks, I hope, are going to last 50 or 100 years. So it's always good to think about matching the durability of the different components in the wall. Um, another interesting choice that we often make is whether to use stainless steel or galvanized steel or mild steel reinforcement. And a lot of that depends on the building owner. Um, in this one case with a church in San Francisco, um, these window mullions originally had mild steel that corroded. It cracked the terracotta. They had to go through all the expense of having new terracotta made. At that point, I think the church wisely made the decision, look, we don't want to have to touch this for another 50 years. Let's go ahead and put in stainless steel reinforcement so that it doesn't corrode and so we, you know, we don't have to worry about it in the future. Um, a very common repair that's done is to clean a building. And a lot of building owners want you to clean their building. And I think two good questions to ask before you get into what material do I use and how do I clean it is, why do you want to clean it? Is it to make it look better? Or is it because there's some sort of dirt that's causing deterioration of the masonry? And then how clean? And sometimes we see buildings that are cleaned, what I would say, 
that are clean too much. So a lot of times we want everything to be, you know, cleaner than clean and whiter than white, and maybe it doesn't really need to be. Um, the first step in cleaning a building is to identify the masonry. And all the standards and um, references for building cleaning in Preservation Brief 1 is a really good one. We'll say to use the gentlest means possible. And so usually that means starting with water. Um, pressure washing either at a, or at a low pressure. Um, misting with water works on some types of stones. Or water washing with a um, detergent and natural bristle brushes. And a lot of times just a water wash will get the building plenty clean and you don't even have to use chemical cleaners. But there are a lot of other options. So there are the different types of cleaners. There are chemical cleaners. And nowadays there's a lot more environmentally friendly cleaners than there used to be. So there's a lot of neutral cleaners. There's acid cleaners, um, which are usually used on granite, some sandstone, unglazed brick and terracotta, cast stone and concrete. And there's alkaline cleaners, um, which are usually used on limestone, marble, calcareous sandstone, glazed brick and terracotta, and polished granite. There's also microabrasive. And this has nothing to do with sandblasting. Please never, go, never sandblast a masonry building. But there are a number of different microabrasive systems out which use things like um, glass beads, crushed dolomite, different very soft, low-pressure abrasives that work often work quite well. There are antimicrobial cleaners. And those you especially need when working on terracotta buildings to get rid of the um, mold and algae, like we saw in the previous slide. And then there are poultices. And poultices are um, Chemicals with some type of neutral um, substance like cellulose that you put on the wall and it draws the stain out. You cover it with plastic, it draws the stain out, and then you can take it off. Um, several potential hazards to be aware of in cleaning. One is freezing temperatures. You never want to put water on a wall when it's going to freeze because the water will freeze in there and cause spalling. Um, hydrofluoric acid can leave salt deposits on the masonry. Hydrochloric acid, which is all called, so called muriatic acid, used to be used quite a lot for cleaning buildings. Um, fortunately, it's not used so much anymore because it can dissolve lime mortar. Um, it can damage brick and stone, leave chloride deposits. And I've also seen it dissolve um, iron in granite and then leave an orange stain behind. And then sodium hydroxide and ammonium bifluoride are sometimes used to clean buildings, and those can leave brownish-yellow stains. So a really important thing to do is always to do a mock-up. So never start cleaning a building without testing in a small area. Um, once you've done that mock-up, you want to compare cleaned and uncleaned areas, and you go out with a field microscope or a loop and just look, say, at this example is terracotta. Look with your magnifying glass, your microscope, at the glaze where it's cleaned and uncleaned. And just make sure it hasn't scratched the glaze or caused any damage. Um, another important um, thing about cleaning is to have controls during construction. So you want to be out there observing the cleaning and making sure that the right chemicals are used, that the nozzle pressure is right, that it's not too close to the masonry. Um, safety and environmental concerns are a big issue um, during cleaning buildings. And now almost all cities have very strict regulations about collecting the runoff water and disposing of it properly. So a few basic rules for cleaning. Um, don't spare the water. So in chemical cleaning, you always want to pre-wet the masonry and then rinse it thoroughly. And then keep the area below where you're cleaning wet. Otherwise, you might have clean streaks running down the building or dirty streaks from all the stuff you're rinsing off. Uh, you want to follow product literature safety precautions. And if you're using a reputable cleaner from a, from a good company, they will give you advice on the phone. They'll come out sometimes and help you with mock-ups and make sure that you're doing everything right. And then as we said, 
you don't want to clean in freezing temperatures. Graffiti and paint removal, um, a lot of the same cautions apply that we talked about uh, with cleaning. It's a very similar to cleaning. Um, disposal and hazardous materials are an issue. So of course, before you remove paint, you want to know if it's lead paint. Um, and the products uh, used nowadays, I think most of them have these sheets like the peel away that you put on and then you can peel it off. And that's really nice for disposal because you're not using a lot of water to rinse off the old paint and the cleaner. It all comes off in this paper that you can then throw away. So there's two types of paint removers that are often used, alkaline and organic solvent. And then um, the photo is uh, checking the pH after it's been cleaned and rinsed to make sure you get it back to a neutral pH. There's a good reference on cleaning historic buildings, preservation brief, um, I mean on removing graffiti, preservation brief 38. Um, water repellent. Everyone is uh, selling water repellents, and it seems that when you talk to um, some building owners or architects, sometimes they'll say, oh, well, we'll fix it all. We'll just put a water repellent on the wall. And that's usually not the first thing you want to do. Um, there was a study um, a few years ago where, um, as an experiment, uh, the investigators took a brick wall that was very deteriorated, and they did four different things to it. They repointed, they surface grouted the entire wall, they surface grouted the mortar joints, and they put a water repellent on it. And on the left is the order of effectiveness. So you have a leaking brick wall, the most effective thing you can do, if the joints are deteriorated, that is, is to repoint it, not to put a water repellent on it. Um, however, there are times when you do want to use a water repellent. And so I would say those times are when the brick is very absorbent or the masonry is very absorbent. Um, and you can deter determine if that's the case by testing it, um, either with a tube that you affix to the masonry in the field and pour water in it, see how fast the water goes in, or by taking a sample and doing a standard ASTM test for absorption, for 24-hour absorption. So if you have a really... Um, a sandstone or a very soft underfire brick that's absorbing tons of water, that's the time you might want to use the water repellent. Remember that you need to repoint the joints before you put the water repellent on, because if you don't, if you put the water repellent on first, then the repointing mortar is not going to stick to the masonry because it's going to repel the water in the mortar. Any type of water repellent you use should be breathable, so it has high water vapor transmission so you're not trapping moisture within the wall. And the most common products um, on the market now that are breathable are silane or siloxane or a combination of the two. And of course, you want the water repellent not to change the appearance. Um, one thing to be careful of is when you put the water repellent on a test panel, it may look fine when it's dry. But when it rains, if you don't do the entire building, the part where you put the water repellent on, water will beat up and the part it doesn't have a water repellent on, the water will soak in, so it will, the appearance will look different. So you need to be careful of that. Um, another type of chemical treatment that's sometimes used, but not, not as often, but you should be aware of it, are stone consolidants. And the purpose of stone consolidants are to restore the cohesion between adjacent grains of stone and restore the integrity of the stone. So they're often used on sandstones, which, as we talked about earlier, want to be a beach. So this helps keep the sandstone from being a beach. Some of the performance requirements of a consolidant are that it penetrates through the masonry. It actually can consolidate it. Um, moisture is not trapped behind it, so it needs to be breathable. Um, it needs to have thermal expansion characteristics similar to the stone and not change the appearance. So there is an ASTM standard or an ASTM guide for the selection and use of stone consolidants. And it lays out a pretty good selection procedure where you take samples of the masonry and you analyze the untreated masonry. 
define what you want the performance requirements to be, treat some samples in the masonry, and then analyze that, and then prepare and evaluate test panels or mock-up panels. And so if you go through that whole process, and you may end up finding out that, yes, this particular stone or this particular part of the building is a good candidate for using a consolidant. Some of the things to consider are the rate of decay of the stone, the past performance of the proposed treatment. So this, I think, goes not just for consolidants, but any type of mortar or cleaner or anything you're going to use on a building, ask the manufacturer for a list of buildings where it's been used before and go take a look at them. And then the artistic and historic value of the material. Probably the, one of the most common repairs that we do to masonry buildings is repointing, or what's called tuck pointing. Um, the first step is to identify which joints to repoint. And it is pretty rare that we would repoint every joint in a masonry building. For one thing, no matter how careful the masons are when they're taking out the old mortar, inevitably they're going to damage the brick or terracotta or whatever your masonry is. So you don't want to repoint unless you really have to. Um, and so here we've gone through with a contractor on this terracotta building, and we've labeled joints that we consider need repointing or that are OK as is. And the contractor can kind of use that as a guide to go through the rest of the building and decide whether joints need to be repointed or not. An important part of repointing is the mortar that you're going to use. Um, you typically want to match the historic mortar unless there's some problem with that mortar that's causing some deterioration. You generally want to match it. You want it to be softer than the adjacent masonry and the same or softer than the original mortar. And so the way to do that is to take a sample of the mortar, have it analyzed. It takes both the chemical and petrographic analysis to determine the mortar composition. Once you have that, um, then, the, then the contractor or mason should submit mortar samples and test panels. The process of repointing is removing the existing mortar to a depth of at least twice the width of the joint. Um, the mortar is usually, it would be usually a cement lime sand or just a lime sand mortar. It's mixed up, wetted a little bit, prehydrated. You pre-wet the substrate, which is what you can see in the photo. That's why that it's wet around the joints. And then pack the mortar in layers and tool the joint to match the adjacent masonry. There are two really good references for repointing. There's an ASTM standard guide for repointing historic masonry. And then there's also a preservation brief. Another common repair that we do is patching. And that's where a small amount of the masonry, such as the terracotta here, is spalled. And so it can be patched with mortar and then coated to match the adjacent masonry. Um, it's pretty common with terracotta because a lot of the pieces are very complicated and it's just too intrusive and expensive to start taking out blocks if you just need to repair a small area. Once the patches get very big or very deep, we usually put in stainless steel reinforcement. And then the patches are built up with mortar and each layer is um, scored so that the next layer can attach to it better. There are a lot of different products on the market, and so and you can also make your own patching mortar out of um, cement, sand, and usually an acrylic additive. And so there's a good reference as a paper that one of my colleagues, C.C. Louie, and I wrote in 2001 that's in the APT Bulletin. And we went back and we looked at 20 years of terracotta buildings that we'd repaired and all the different products that we'd used for mortar patching and coating to see how they were holding up after that time. Um, another repair that we often have to do with masonry is anchoring. And it's nice when we can anchor blocks in situ without having to remove them from the building. There's a lot of different systems on the market now. Um, on the upper right is a system that uses a stainless steel rod encased in a sock, and then you pump grout into that sock, and it can fill 
the voids between very irregular backup walls. On the lower right is a helical anchor, which is really nice because it drills through the masonry and cuts its own threads, and so you don't need to embed it in epoxy or anything. It just anchors right back into the backup. And then on the left is a veneer anchor where it's an expansion anchor into the backup wall and then into the veneer that you're trying to anchor. So with all of these, it's really important to determine what is the backup wall. And sometimes that's going to take an opening to do that. Um, you have to think about what's the purpose of the anchoring, and then all these types of anchors will need to be field tested to verify that they're working and doing what you need them to do. Um, we've used the helical anchors uh, for a couple of different cases. One is a terracotta building where a lot of the lintels were cracked, and the owner was not able to replace the terracotta, so we patched it and then anchored the individual pieces up to the backup. But we had to make sure that there was solid backup behind that we could anchor to. And then we tested, pulled out some of the helical anchors. And that's on the right is a stone veneer, and we're just testing a helical anchor because we want it was not properly anchored to start with, and we wanted to make sure that we could get the strength we needed out of that helical anchor. We've also used anchoring to stitch broken pieces together. So I don't have a photo, but I've had contractors remove <clears throat> pieces of a terracotta block and then use stainless steel rods set in epoxy to, to stitch those pieces together and then put the same piece back in the wall. Um, retooling is a good solution for sandstone that has this problem of the face coming off. Um, where the architecture of the building allows. On this building, every other course was projecting. And so we could, instead of having to patch or replace the sandstone, have the stonemasons go in and just retool the surface and cut the same kind of grooves into the stone so that it matches. Um, they also did this on a more decorative column. A repair that I really like for sandstone is partial replacement, which is also called Dutchman. So here is a um, large sandstone column that's very deteriorated. There's been a lot of uh, spalling at the base of the column. And the owner fortunately had new sandstone that they had a stockpile of the same stone that was used on the original building. And so we could have these Dutchman made, and we just cut it back three inches thick. They made new blocks to match the existing and then put them in. And then on the lower left, you can see the finished product. So, well, it's not completely finished, but some of the new Dutchman. And I like that much more for sandstone than patches, because as I said before, sandstone just tends to reject patches. And so Dutchman is a, is a better solution. Um, unit replacement is sometimes you have to do when the units are very deteriorated. So on the upper left, we have this same terracotta cornice. And on the upper right, you can see why the blocks were all cracking. Those outriggers are very corroded. We had new terracotta blocks made to match and then lifted up and put in place. Um, sometimes we do use substitute materials. Some criteria for using substitute materials are visual compatibility, of course. Um, the physical properties must um, be the same, or, or they must be installed to tolerate differences with the original material. So in this photo on the right, we're using GFRC to replace some sandstone coins. And the GFRC will expand and contract a lot more than the sandstone. So just at that location, around each GFRC panel, we have a sealant joint instead of a mortar joint. The substitute materials should meet the performance criteria and Secretary of Interior standards. A good reference for substitute materials is Preservation Brief 16. Um, it's a bit old, but it does go through a lot of the different materials that are on the market and talks about um, the advantages and disadvantages of each material. Um, Secretary of Standards on substitute materials says the reason you'd use the substitute material is the historical material is unavailable. 
um, skilled craftsmen are unavailable, there's inherent flaws in the original material, or building codes require change. So the example I just showed of the sandstone at the time the quarry was closed. We probably could have gotten sandstone to match from another quarry from a different part of the country, but at the time we made the decision to, uh, and the owner made the decision to use um, the GFRC. Other considerations are that the replacement material is lighter weight. It offers reduced maintenance. Um, it can be manufactured more quickly than the original or at a lower cost. Um, on this particular building, we did a lot of terracotta replacement on this church, and there was only one area where we used a substitute material, and that was GFRC for these um, ornaments that you can see in the middle photo on the lower part. And they were very intricate, they were cantilevered out, and they would have been really difficult to manufacture in terracotta and to attach back to the structure. So everything on that building is now old or new terracotta except for those one elements, but I think it looks pretty good and it was, it was a good solution to that problem. This building um, had its parapet just cut straight off three courses down from the top. Um, during some, probably in response to San Francisco's parapet ordinance, but it was completely gone. So this beautiful building didn't have the fluted top, it just had, was cut off straight. And so during a renovation, um, the owners wanted to put that original top back on and they used uh, FRP or fiber reinforced plastic to do it. Um, a really important part of a masonry building restoration are copings, flashings, and roofing. And those aren't masonry, and you may think, why is this important? It's not masonry conservation. But it is going to prolong the life of the masonry. So on the upper left is one of those hidden gutters that we talked about before. And here we're replacing the tile roof and putting in a new copper gutter that's integrated with the copper flashing that goes to the edge of the roof. So it's really waterproof and durable. Um, another thing that I like to do where you can is to put sheet metal copings on the tops of um, water tables, parapet. One concern often is the appearance. And on this particular high rise, on the right you can see the red arrow is pointing to the um, coping over the parapet, and then on the lower left, you can see it up close. And yeah, maybe you can see it in the photo on the right a little bit, but it's not when it's painted the same color as the masonry, it's not that noticeable, and it will do so much to protect the masonry below, as well as in this case, the waterproofing or roofing on that balcony um, will really protect the terracotta below. As we said, um, you want to protect sky-facing surfaces. They're all small roofs, and so um, there's a number of different ways to do that. Uh, sheet metal coping is good. Um, here we used a copper flat seam roof over this large flat area of the church on the lower left. On the lower right is some uh, kind of ziggurat style terracotta, and we didn't really want a coping over the whole thing, so we repointed the joints and then used silicone tape over each of the joints to just give a little extra measure of protection. And then on the upper right are the um, lead caps that you often see people put in mortar joints. Windows and doors. Um, our objective of windows, repairing windows and doors is to keep water out of the building and out of the masonry walls. But in addition, you have safety, so they have to be adequately anchored to the building. A lot of times you'll have acoustic considerations and energy performance. Um, a lot of times you need to evaluate whether to replace windows or not. We found a good way to determine whether to repair a window is to repair a couple of mock-up windows. And so that's what we're doing here. We defined a performance criteria, surveyed the windows, um, made some trial repairs, 
and then water tested the window after the trial repairs to show the owner, yeah, this is how well the window will perform if you, if you repair it in place. Um, now we're to the construction document and construction process. Um, I think there are some uh, items to consider when preparing construction documents for historic projects that may be different than for new construction. One is that you have historic elements that you want to protect that are part of the building, and so that needs to be part of the specification. Another is quality assurance and contractor qualification. And sometimes that is a, con um, a concern, with, especially with public bids. But I know a lot of agencies have found really good ways to, in the specifications, be very specific about what qualifications are required of the contractor. Maybe have the contractor submit their qualifications first and then score those and say, OK, these five contractors submitted their qualifications. They're all qualified. Now they can bid. Um, another consideration uh, for historic projects is that uh, sometimes you're working in an occupied building. So you have to be aware of noise and dust and staying out of the building occupant's way. Um, these type of buildings are full of hazardous materials. So you want to have an um, industrial hygienist do a survey, determine where those hazardous, hazardous materials are. Um, I know we find them often right next to the masonry. So for example, the church, terracotta church I was showing the photos of um, had asbestos in the sealant. And this sealant was between the masonry, between the terracotta, and the stained glass windows. And so we had to get an abatement contractor to come in and work with a restoration contractor to safely remove that asbestos sealant. Um, another topic to consider is contingencies. And I think contingencies are even more important on existing buildings than they are on new construction because sometimes you just don't know what you're going to find when you start opening up walls. Um, there's a good reference that uh, CSI and I think APT was a co-authored um, produced called Guide to Preparing Construction Documents for Historic Buildings. Um, one part of construction documents that is always interesting to work on is repair quantities. So for example, you're um, going to bid out the repair of this high-rise terracotta building, and you want to tell the contractor how many square feet of glaze ball repairs, or how many linear feet of cracks do they have. And there's two approaches. One is to do a 100% close-up survey, which I've done. Um, but that's pretty expensive up front. Another is to do 100% binocular survey from the street so you can see if there's any horrible problems, and then do a partial close-up survey. And so that's what we did um, that this photo shows. And on the construction documents, we even marked where the survey areas were, and then we extrapolated the repair quantities in those survey areas to the overall building. One thing that I've found after doing this a number of times is the repair quantities will usually be higher than you think. Um, and so then in the bid documents, you will give allowances for the different repair quantities and then ask the contractor for unit prices if you have more or less than those quantities. Now the problem with doing it that way is then somebody has to keep track of this during construction. So you have to keep track of the quantities. We've mentioned mock-ups. That's a really important part of the construction process. They should be defined in the specifications, and sometimes even shown on the drawings where you want the mock-ups to be. And the approved mock-up will form the standard for the rest of the work. It should be done by the same masons as will work on the building. And I've had a project where we even um, gave each mason had to do a repointing sample, remove the mortar, put in new mortar, and then they got a badge and they were allowed to do the repointing on that work. And of course, no work um, on the building other than the mock-up should be done until it's approved by the engineer or architect or owner. Um, 
a few things to think about during construction. Of course, we all want to have a team approach. So when we have the architect, engineer, conservator, contractor, owner, everybody on the same team, that always is really nice. We like to do pre-construction meetings <clears throat> for each subcontractor and just go through the project and what we expect, the submittals, all the different, all the important things. You can always expect hidden conditions on a historic building when you're doing masonry repairs, even though you've done a thorough investigation and you've made your openings. I guarantee you will, you'll always find some surprise. And at the end of the project, it's nice to give a maintenance manual or maintenance instructions to the owner because they've probably just spent a lot of money restoring this building and it's great when you can give them a schedule that says how often they should inspect it, look at the sealant joints, look at the mortar joints, and what materials to use. I find that's very useful. So finally, some key ideas. Um, understanding how to conserve masonry materials really requires understanding the materials themselves and how they work in the building. Um, you want to diagnose before you repair and perform adequate investigation during the design phase to reduce surprises during construction. Um, water is often uh, the source of many problems. Sometimes your repairs, less repairs are better, so do no harm, less is more. And both traditional and modern repair techniques and repair materials have their place. So thank you for uh, joining this webinar and listening. And I'm Carolyn Searles with SGH. There's my contact information. Um, so please, I'd like to uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Carolyn. This is Cindy. Um, we don't have any questions at this time. So I'll tell our audience, if you have any questions, please send them in. Um, within the next minute. Uh, if you don't get your questions in, you think of something you'd like to ask Carolyn, take down her uh, email address and contact her directly or contact us at the California Preservation Foundation at cpf at californiapreservation.org. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, you will receive an email with a link to a survey, and uh, we will also send a link to a PDF copy of this presentation. We would appreciate any feedback on this webinar and recommendations for future topics. It really helps us as we are planning our programs throughout the year, so uh, your recommendations are important to us. Um, I also want to remind you that this program qualifies for AIA and AICP continuing education units. Um, finally, if you're not a member of the California Preservation Foundation, we encourage you to join as an individual, a nonprofit, a government, or a corporate member. Each member receives benefits, including discounts to all of our programs, such as this webinar. Um, and our entire webinar series, workshops, our conference and awards program, um, and our members only tours. Membership at different levels also includes a complimentary webinar, so please visit our website or give us a call to find out about our um, membership programs. Um, I'd also like to remind our attendees to uh, mark your calendar. We have a couple of great events coming up. On Friday, September 27th is the California Preservation Awards, um, which includes the presentation of the uh, Preservation Design Awards. It's the 30th anniversary of that program, and we'll also be um, presenting a new book that was written about the California Preservation Foundation and the award program called Here Tomorrow by Hay Day, written, actually written by J.K. Deneen with a forward by John King and published by Hay Day. Um, on October 26th, we have a tour at the Oliver Ranch in Geyserville. It is a 100-acre uh, property in the Alexander Valley, Valley featuring 18 uh, remarkable site-specific installations by artists, including Andy Goldsworthy, Anne Hamilton, Bruce Nauman, Martin Purier, and uh, Richard Serra. Uh, it's a two-and-a-half-hour tour led by by Stephen Oliver. And um, it's open to our members. Um, there is a fee for attending, and information will be posted on our website. That's Saturday, October 26th. 
Uh, your attendance at this program helps us fulfill our mission to provide leadership to protect California's historic sites and communities through our advocacy and education programs. We thank you for joining us today and hope you have a good afternoon.